Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, go on. Oh, Sam, um, yeah, Sam, Springer. Yeah. <laughs> Good luck <laughs> with that. Um, the last time I, I typed up the notes of the thing, and um, you said check. You need to check out your root notes on the C harp. On the C harmonica, yeah. Yeah. So um, the root fifth and the root seventh, you said. On the Remember diatonic, I... is this what I did two weeks ago? Yeah. Sorry, a few weeks ago, yeah. Where For are blues. they? So on a on a on a C diatonic, you've got yeah. your arpeggios. Actually, my latest free video. Actually, this is a good time to do this. My latest free lesson on YouTube, which is there, tells you your arpeggios on a diatonic harmonica. <laughs> and so on and so forth. So maybe check that out. And yeah, um, yeah because they're, they're, it's really easy. It's related to the chords you play. You're just breaking that down to single notes and the root notes. Root note yeah. third. Like the root note third, fifth. Yeah. Root note fifth, seventh. And then up to the octave. This is supposed to be a chromatic harmonica lesson, though. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I'm starting to panic then, so. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I've, I've planned and out. Got diatonic as well in brackets. Yeah, so it's. Shall I begin? Because I, I think it's a few minutes Adam, past. He says some of his stuff's relevant as well. So, um, do you want to get going then? Yeah, somewhere? I was going to say. Um, let's get started. I'm going to close the. Um, I'm going to close the chat, so if you have a question, just type it in the chat and we'll get to a break in about 15 minutes where you guys will be playing some exercises. And Sam Wilkinson can shout the, the questions at me and I'll answer them then. If you haven't, please mute yourself. Um, do have a diatonic harmonica with you in C, um, but this is a chromatic harmonica lesson, so you know this guy should be your focus. Um, this lesson is designed for, you know, beginners and intermediates, and I suppose in mind I had players, um, which was me a few years ago, that are trying to go from the diatonic um, onto the chromatic. Um, before I launch into the lesson, sort of full blow, a big thank you to Sam Wilkinson. I always forget to say thank you, and I don't think he gets the credit he deserves. He's put on a lot of work doing these lockdown sessions. Um, no, he has, and he deserves, you know, a little round of applause for it, so well done, well done, Sam. Um, you're silent clapping, I love it. <laughs> That's, that seems like some sort of Zen Buddhist saying, silent clapping. Anyways, um, a little bit about me is posted in the chat. Um, you, can, you can listen to my band there, you can go on my YouTube and hear me playing. Um, there are free lessons on YouTube, um, both on the diatonic and the chromatic harmonicas. Do please give them a go. Um, who's the guy? I was thinking about this today. There was a 19th century guy who said, the car will never replace the horse. Um, or something to that effect, the automobile will never replace the horse. Free lessons on YouTube are great, and I do hope that you, you find them useful, but they, they're just not quite the same as getting a, an interactive lesson one-on-one. -on -one. So do ask me some questions today, do book a lesson with myself or Adam, who will be um, presenting after. I have had lessons with Adam, he is amazing, and, um, and what have you. The other two resources I put in that little chat are, if you get bored of listening to me, you can have a read of them. Um, one is by... Um, a chromatic harmonica player who's sadly no longer with us called Franz Schmel, who in my opinion is probably the greatest or certainly undeniably one of the greatest classical um, harmonica players of you know, the past and early century. And if you read that document, it's very interesting. It will give you some great tips, but the fundamental thing of it is he says, if you want to get good on the chromatic harmonica is take it very seriously and practice for five hours a day. Now, I don't have five hours a day. I wish to God that I did, but um, I think that's a good mantra to have. The, the other little document I sent over was by a guy called Jamie Abersold. And Jamie was an instructor who sort of came out in the 70s and 80s when everybody was interested in jazz music, but nobody really knew how to get started with it. And Jamie sort of put this sort of documents and these courses together and, um, and just really, really sort of gave people a step-by-step -step um, methodology of learning jazz. So if you're interested in learning jazz, then do have a read of that later on this afternoon or tomorrow or, or what have you. Um, so my, my sort of journey on to coming to the chromatic harmonica, I was a diatonic player since I was 13. I picked it up naturally and I loved it. And I got good on it very, very quickly. And I sort of got to a very good point where I mastered second position and third position. 
But then I'd always had a chromatic sort of lying around. And I think like a lot of players, maybe we know a few songs, maybe we know Summertime. Or we know whatever, but we don't really take learning on it seriously. And we tend to just know a few tunes and we break it out now and then. So in my early 20s, I sort of decided that that wasn't enough. I had to get serious in my life. I had to learn how to read music and I had to just take this instrument a little bit more seriously and develop a routine where hopefully I can see some progress on it and I can you know, get to learning things and getting to read pieces of music confidently or playing you know, with other people confidently. Um, so hopefully I'm gonna give you guys a practice routine to do that today. And I thought I would structure this lesson um, along the lines of my current practice routine that works for me. So each and every day, each and every morning when I make my cup of tea in the morning and I give myself a couple of hours to, to, to play, um, I start by warming up the harmonica and I warm up with a chromatic scale. <laughs> And I'll play that up and down the instrument and we'll play that in a second together. And that was sort of step one for me is as a diatonic player, I sort of knew where everything was, but on the chromatic, I was always getting lost and I was just getting frustrated and I couldn't find my way. So playing a chromatic scale really, really helped me find where everything was. So we'll, we'll have a look at that in a few moments. After I've warmed up the instrument with a chromatic scale, I would then do something related to music theory. And as soon as you say music theory to people, everybody hisses and shrinks up and says, no, I don't want to learn it, no, no, no. But I don't spend all day doing music theory. I'll do it for five or 10 minutes. And I think if you do five or 10 minutes um, every day, eat your broccoli, eat your vegetables, then you, you will master every scale on this instrument, every arpeggio on this instrument, and you'll be able to look at music a lot more confidently. And Today, because I can already see you going, well, he's going to do that now. He's going to teach us some music theory. We're just going to do the major scale in C, which you can probably already do on a diatonic harmonica. It's commonly known as first position. We're just going to transfer that exact same breathing pattern onto the chromatic harmonica. Only we're going to have some fun with it. And I think you should make theory fun. I don't think you should just sit there for half an hour playing scales. That would drive anybody insane. We're going to do some exercises on that and make it fun. So I've warmed up. I've gotten over the music theory hurdle. Next in my little practice routine um, would be to approach new repertoire or songs that I don't know yet. I might be looking at it for the first time and I'm not going to be able to play it confidently. Why would you be able to? It's the first time you're looking at that piece of music or trying to pick something up by ear. You're not going to get it just like that. Or maybe as part of that new repertoire, I've got a song on the go and I really like the beginning of it, but I'm not so sure about the middle and the ending's fantastic. So I'm great on the beginning and the middle, but I really need to tighten up the end. So that's the third part of my routine is, um, is new repertoire and, you know, getting things finished. Lastly, I like to finish off by playing my old repertoire, songs that I know how to play. I love playing them, some, maybe some keys that I'm, I'm confident improvising over. And, you know, for the last, depending on how much time you've got, let's say I've got now, it's the last 15, 20 minutes, I'll just sit there and have some fun. And if you, if you run your regime like that, you're always ending on a positive note. Um, so if you haven't already got a pen and paper, do just take a moment and think, right, I need to look at a practice routine, warm up. Um, a little bit of theory, never hurt anybody. New repertoire, and I'm not going to show you new repertoire today. I thought I'd just talk a little bit about, you know, some songs that you might want to look at and some challenges that you might be facing with this guy and, and what have you. And again, with old repertoire, I am not going to sit here and play, you know, every song I know because you'll all fall asleep. But I thought we could talk a little bit more directly about some songs that you might already know on the diatonic harmonica, which cross over easily onto the chromatic. I think Adam might be doing a little bit of that, so I don't want to touch on, touch on that too much, but yeah, hopefully you should find that interesting. So let's warm up the, the harmonica with the chromatic scale. Before I begin, are people familiar with how you hold, some diatonic players traditionally hold a diatonic like this, possibly you adopt a chromatic grip where you play it like that, and you're just pulling the hands over together like that. And I tend to advocate quite strongly that you keep your head still and you move the harmonica with your hands. You can also even angle the harmonica. You can get a compensation for your overbite. Same with the chromatic. I tend to, excuse me, I tend to prefer that grip. And, you know, just moving just like a butterfly like there. And then I've got my, my finger over for that. 
You can do a Wawa. I was never overly happy with a Wawa, but some people like it. Um, Sam, if, are there any questions at this stage about that sort of grip? No questions at this stage. No, no. perfect. The other thing, which is a little bit bigger uh, of an issue for, the, for the, the chromatic, is that on the diatonic, I always preferred lip pursing, which is where you whistle like that. Um, on the chromatic, I prefer tongue blocking, which is where you cover several holes and you breathe out of a corner of your mouth. Something you might want to ask Adam about is that he uses a technique called U-blocking. So there's different embouchures you might want to try. I prefer tongue blocking because although I find it a little bit slower, I think it gives a little bit more tone. And as I said, when I first started out on this properly four or five years ago, I used to get lost all the time. Tongue blocking and having more of my embouchure on the instrument gave me a bigger reference point and gave me a little bit more control. Um, so things you might want to consider, whatever embouchure you use, it'll work for today and just let's have some fun with it. So this is where things get interesting because I have to share my screen. Um, and don't go, ah, cheap music when you see it. I've written the tab underneath and I will walk you through every little step. Uh, pages and starting it. Is that how it works? Hey. How about that? So I'm hoping that comes through and perhaps when this lesson will get posted by Sam as a video, I will attach this document because I'd, I'd sent those links to you there, which you already have on the chat. And that is gonna be our first exercise. Don't worry about that. That top thing is just the harmonica layout, which some of you might know. Um, we're just gonna look at a chromatic scale across one octave and I'm gonna call the notes out to you. Um, as I said, the chromatic scale was really useful to me because again, crossing over from a diatonic, it showed me where all the notes are. And once I could calibrate that in my mind, then it was just simply pattern playing almost. And uh, I found that really, really, really useful. So I've written the pluses obviously mean exhale, the minuses mean inhale, and where it has a dash underneath, that means that you're using a slide. Um, I've just done it across one octave. The sort of the magic trick on the chromatic is that once you know something in one octave, you're just replicating it across the other octaves of the instrument. So once you get good in the lower octave, you can play in the middle octave and the top octave. Um, so I'll play that through once very, very slowly with you. So flow one. So it doesn't sound like the, the sexiest or jazziest thing in the world, I know. Um, what I would say, the other thing I was doing is when I was mapping out this, this chromatic scale, is in my head, possibly more from a diatonic than a chromatic perspective, I was thinking, right, so hole one, I've got four notes there. Hole two, I've got three notes. I appreciate you can play F in two ways, either blow with the slide in or draw slide out. But, Pick one and just keep the other one in the back of your mind for now. So I'd go, right, hold one, four notes, hold two, three notes. Uh, hold three, four notes, and the same breathing pattern as hold one. And I'd sort of replicate that mental, mental thing. Then on hold four, I'd say, well, that's just B natural. That's one note. So I'd have this pattern in my mind of four, three, four, one. And then I'm starting a new octave. And that, for me, gave me a very, very quick breathing pattern to go... have you. I don't suggest you race through it like that at all, but that's a very, very quick tip for warming up the instrument. And like I said, that mental model really, really helped me. Um, but you taking this and you after this lesson playing the chromatic scale will no doubt find it boring because I certainly did. Um, there are things you can do to make that interesting, and I'm thinking at this stage of articulation. So you can try things like tremolo, where you're, you're sort of stuttering your breath and go... <laughs> Same as you would on a diatonic harmonica, you'd do the same thing. So you can go. I don't know how clearly the microphone is picking that up, but hopefully you're getting the effect. 
um, and diatonic players, pr you probably already know that technique and you can bring that across very quickly. And all of a sudden, what looks like a boring chromatic scale exercise becomes quite interesting. Um, the other thing you can do is vibrato. Um, and again, those of you that are used to playing a diatonic harmonica will be used to bending notes. And they do say, don't bend notes on a chromatic. And I have to agree, I don't think this sounds good. I don't think that sounds good at all. But what chromatic players will do is they'll do an ever so, such a slight bend, almost just on the tip of the reed. Franz Schmel, the guy I posted, was the king of this. And they'll do it just to get a little bit of tone. I'll try and demonstrate it. Um, are you getting a very, very slight variation in pitch there? So those are two things you can try out. Um, the other thing you can try out, which I'd completely neglected until a few weeks ago, and I'm desperately trying to catch up, is tonguing in the same way you know a classical flute player or a clarinet player will, will tongue the instrument to get a very, very strong staccato effect. And again, that's something that a diatonic player does all the time. You know, you can create all sorts of rhythms by just having a, an almost aggressive, in that case, tonguing style. So I thought, let's, let's just take a few moments and uh, I'll give you, you know, let's two minutes and I'll take any questions and just try the chromatic scale by yourself. Try tonguing aggressively <laughs> like I just did. Try the vibrato, just subtly, subtly bending the pitch and try the tremolo. Um, often when chromatic players use tremolo and vibrato, they'll often use them together. Um, I'll play my party piece. Um, notes like that that are using tremolo and vibrato at the same time to just get a really really strong tone out of the instrument. I hope again the microphone picked that up and did it some justice. Um, but yeah I'm going to give you guys two minutes and ask me any any questions. <laughs> and salud, cheers, happy Sunday. Uh, Saturday, excuse me, I wish it was Sunday. Where's the chat box? Oh, sorry, excuse me. Let's keep it on the chromatic scale. Sorry. Are there any questions so far, Sam, or are we okay? Okay. Don't be afraid. I don't bite. can see videos where some people are playing vigorously and some people are just looking at me like, oh, and then next bit. <laughs> okay, I think that should give you, give you enough time. Um, hopefully you've made some notes on your piece of paper and you've thought to yourself, okay, later on I'm gonna learn the chromatic scale. And I'm going to take some time, you know, looking at my articulation, tonguing, vibrato, and tremolo. Next part of my little practice routine is to do a, a scale, a musical scale. Um, and we're going to look at some scales and some arpeggios right now, based around C major. And the, I think the sort of the hang-up for diatonic players crossing over is learning in every key. Because normally as a diatonic, certainly as a blues man, when you want to change key, you just pick up a different instrument that's in the key you want, right? And that makes our lives very, very easy. Um, the chromatic, I think you have to have the discipline, at least, like I said, just five to ten minutes a day to work on your scales and work on your arpeggios. Um, like I said, I'd, already, I'd always ignored this stuff when I was a teenager and when I was, you know, being taught music at school, just your GCSE stuff. I just thought, nah, I'm so rock and roll. I'm, gonna, I'm a blues man. I learn everything by ear. And in hindsight, you know, I wish I'd learned it sooner. Um, there's, there's no glory in ignorance. 
Um, but yeah, the chances are you already know how to play C major on a diatonic. It's just first position, so holes four to seven, I played it already. You can transfer that pattern quite easily onto the chromatic. And I haven't written the, the tab out there because I thought, come on, you guys are going to know C major. And I'm sure that's, that's fine with you. Now, the, the way to do it that I find is really, really effective and which I think will, you know, give you a lot of scope on the instrument is depending on obviously how much time of the day you have to practice is spend one week on one scale and the accompanying arpeggios, which I'll talk about in a minute. And then next week, I've written the circle of fifths there. So let's say this week we've learned C. Next week, learn F. And F is exactly the same as C. We've just got one note difference. Or if you don't want to learn F, go to G. It's just one note difference. Then the week after that, you've learned F, which is a good jazz key. Go to B flat, which is an even better jazz key. There's just two notes difference. And if we go back to this chromatic model that I had in my head, this breathing exercise model, you will find that patterns sort of emerge for you, breathing patterns. So there's a, a particular breathing pattern for, for, for C major, right? It's blow, inhale, blow, inhale, blow, inhale, inhale, blow, right? You'll find your own patterns based around those breathing, um, breathing sort of patterns as you go through each key, and it will just become a mnemonic thing. You, you'll do it by instinct to go to F. Um, next one's B flat. Um, B flat, classic jazz key. But week by week, just for five, ten minutes a day, and then in your mind, just think, well, three months from now, by the end of the year, I'm going to be able to play confidently um, in every key. Now again, much like what I did with the chromatic scale, me telling you for five minutes a day to just go, again, that would bore the socks off of most people. And um, you, you've got to make these things interesting and you can make anything interesting um, by breaking it down, mixing it up, chopping it up and having some fun with it. So you can try the articulation that I've already showed you. Um, what else have I, I've put all sorts of ideas on my book that I could talk to you about. Um, one of the jazz things um, that most jazz players do, and that Jamie Abersold book says, is go to the ninth degree of back. So when, don't stop at C, go to the high D and then come back. And then you get an almost running effect. So while the adverts are on, you know, you're watching Home and Away or EastEnders and the adverts come on, you can go... <laughs> Just adding that extra note, D, um, after C at the top end, makes it flow very easily. You can break it down into sort of small, almost rock and roll and jazzy patterns you can play in thirds. So I'm just playing the notes and going up. You can play it in fourths. And so on and so forth. Just make your own little patterns and have some fun with it and find patterns that you like, um, which suit you. As you progress, if you are a tongue blocker and you're playing out both corners of your mouth, you might want to try octaves. And what have you. Um, you might, if you really want to do something advanced, which I, I, I'm doing a little bit of at the moment, try octave switching. And so on and so forth and then come back down. Um, those are all some great ideas. What other ideas can I give you? Um, you can try the modes on your instrument. Again, modes is a music theory term and people tend to hear them and they've got intimidating names like Aeolian and Lydian and Ionian and what have you. All those terms mean is that you're playing C major but you're just starting on a different note. So C major or Ionian, you already know. <laughs> Again, that sounds quite intimidating. It just means C major, but starting on D, the second note. And it gives it a minor tonality, but it's still exactly the same notes of what you already know in terms of slide and breathing pattern as C. And then you can go to E, do the same thing. And you know, five, 10 minutes a day, 
just practice stuff like that. Um, I'm going to, to give you again another two or three minutes to just have some fun with those ideas and ask any questions. And um, yeah, like I said, theory only gets boring if you make it boring. Make it yours, have some fun. Hi Sam, there's a few questions that have come through. Okay, great. Uh, hang on, I'll try and pull up the, the chat. Um, oh, I hit it, hit me. Okay, um, Ross asks, when you say hole one, do you mean hole three on a 16 hole? On a 16 hole, where is my 16 hole? <laughs> on a hole one, no, I mean, um, normally on a chromatic, sorry Ross, are you on video? Because I can, I can patch down to you. So every four notes is an, sorry, every four holes is an octave. Um, so yeah, you're actually looking at hole, you'd be looking at hole five to get that C that I was playing there. But you can play it on the bass octave as well. So that's that's um, hole four there. I started on hole five for that second scale. Does that answer your question? I hope so. Ah, yeah. So I see what you mean. So you mean on the chromatic scale here, you would be starting on hole five, yeah, and you would be applying that same breathing pattern and that same slide to breathing um, action. Sorry. I'm with you now. Okay, another question from me. Um, you've already answered part of it, but I said, do you practice major scales or are there different modes which yep. you've mentioned, but like harmonic minor definitely, and then the pentas pentatonic major minor? You should do that. You should definitely do the harmonic minor, and that's something I'm, I'm doing at the moment. With the pentatonics, I always just felt like my background was as a guitar player, and when I was about... Well, it's actually my background is diatonic. I started on diatonic, then I went to guitar, and then I went to chromatic. But on the guitar, the pentatonic is, is just so overused. And it just becomes pattern playing. When I was about 15 and 16 and got serious on the guitar, learning the scales just became so much more interesting to me. So I tend to just teach the scale, the major scale, because the pentatonic is within that. And you, you sort of learn what notes not to play when you solo. And that sort of works for me, um, is knowing everything and then cutting it down. That was sort of my process, is that, oh my God, I keep getting lost on this. I need to know where everything is. So I need to know the chromatic scale, know where everything is, then break it down to my scales. And you can break it down a little bit smaller to your pentatonics. We we're actually going to do something I got cut off. When we start again, I'll look at the arpeggios and I'll give you a second quick playing um, moment. Any other questions? Um, just a couple of, um, well, actually someone saying, David says, I'm trying to do more variation in my practice. And then David's also saying, so he's not the same person, just start to learn those. So obviously that's, um, that's pretty much the essence of what you're saying, isn't it? A little bit of, mm. um, variation. Um, yeah, definitely. Practice and then we've got swipes. He's saying, does it help with ADHD? Um, I'm undiagnosed, but my, my like I said, my partners and people know me that say you have got a scatterbrain, young man. I tend to be able to focus in on things very well. Um, that's sort of the upside of having ADHD. Supposedly, is that when you do find something fascinating. You can just sit there and do it for hours and hours and hours. And I can just sit there and go, C major. And, and on and on. And, you know, C sharp. D. E flat. And just go all the way through it. So use it to your benefit. If you find it interesting, you'll do it and you'll get very good at it. Um, yeah. Be in love with the thing and, 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 and it will work for you. Um, the little thing that I missed off when I was showing you those scales, sorry, I'll pick things up again, um, is that be aware of the arpeggios that accompany your scale as well. This is probably the second aspect of what you should, should practice if you're a complete beginner and you're going through this, I'm going to learn one scale a week, is to learn the accompanying arpeggios. Um, the, the disciplinarian in me would say, just go out there, get a piece, of, get, a, get a crib sheet with all the arpeggios on as a piece of music and learn it. The easy way to learn your arpeggios is when you're playing your scale, so we've got C major, is to play a note, skip a note, play a note, skip a note, play a note. So I'll show you. C major seven in a C major scale, well, we start on C. Skip a note D, go to E. 
skip a note which would be F, go to G, skip a note A, go to B, and then you've got your octave C. Same with if you take the next note in C major, the scale would be D, and we can play a D minor 7. That, that is the chord which accompanies that scale, and you will probably see a lot when you're soloing. And I think if, if Adam's doing what I think he's going to be doing, he's going to be talking about how you solo over chord changes. So knowing the chords and knowing the arpeggios is very important. So we played C, now D is the second note in a C major scale. Play a note, skip a note, which would be E, play a note F, um, skip a note, which would be G, A, skip a note, which would be B, go to C, and then you're back to the octave. Take that formula for E, E minor. Take that formula for F, which would be F major 7. G, the dominant. A, the relative minor, um, minor 7. And then um, the minor 7 flat 5. Do that with all your scales as well. Um, and you'll find that, so when you go to F, and I told you that finger breathing pattern for F is similar to C, but slightly different. You'll just simply find that you're following the, the breathing pattern through and just, like I said, playing a note, skipping a note. That's the cheating way of doing it. Um, interestingly enough, you can do that on your diatonic harmonica as well. Those arpeggios are there in the middle octave. cheat for the last one, um, which is a B minor 7 flat 5. You can get a B by over um, by blow bending 10, not over blowing, it's a blow bend. It sounds awful in my opinion. Anybody who goes up into the 10 hole on a diatonic is, is just showing off in my opinion. But there we go. Um, you can again relate your practice on the diatonic harmonica onto the chromatic. Um, I've got a couple more points left to talk about, but would you like a moment to just practice those arpeggios? I'll give you one minute to practice those arpeggios. And again, write this sort of technique down and take it away with you. And I'm gonna stop um, sharing my screen. How do I stop doing that? Stop share, that would be the one. Okay. Uh, sorry, so another question. Mm -hmm. What is blow bending? So sorry to right. <laughs> So on a diatonic, you will have um, draw bends between holes one and six, which you're probably familiar with. <laughs> on the, the top notes, holes seven, but really it's holes eight and nine and 10. You can bend the note by blowing. Um, and you can get some more notes on the instrument. Um, I'm going to talk a, bit, a little bit about this at the end as well. Um, you can also overblow notes, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, um, that was going to be my final point, and I'll talk about that a little bit more then. Um, but yeah, don't lose your sleep about it. I mean, this for me is still really is a blues instrument playing the holes between one and six, and occasionally just using the top octave to, to give you some variation. <laughs> what have you. Um, but yeah, <laughs> it's that sort of conundrum that as soon as you start going up to that holes 9 and 10, particularly on a high harmonica like an F or an E diatonic harmonica, it will sound very shrill. Whereas I think on the chromatic, actually, some, some of the high notes can sound really, really nice. Um, where am I? You know, that's the highest note up there. And then he does the next bit, which is really, really difficult. Okay, um, i am got about five, six minutes left, so I'm gonna wrap up um, talking about new repertoire. Um, again, when, when I was decided in my early 20s, I thought, why well, we need to take the chromatic seriously. I made a real commitment to, to learning how to read music. 
Um, you know, I could read music before, but I would have to, again, get pen and paper and probably write the notes underneath. It would take me a little while. Whereas through, through serious practice, I'm now quite comfortable with sight reading pitch. It takes me a little while sometimes to get rhythms. I need to practice my rhythm and my ability to read rhythm very quickly. But um, I've found huge improvements doing that. And actually most musicians, even you know professional classical guys that have had years of training will say, well, it, you, I never just get a score. They'll say, I'll listen to the piece first and I'll pretty, probably, probably have the rhythms and a sound of what it's doing in my head and then I'll, I'll read the score. So don't let... Don't let sheet music intimidate you at all. Just take it, take it step by step. I have a um, an unfortunate tendency to jump in at the deep end. So I remember the the sort of songs that I started trying to learn when I was, like I said, in my twenties, were far too difficult for what I was trying to do. I was trying to do things like. Mm. and so on and so forth. It's like whoa, 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 whoa. You need, to, you need to put the blinders on, you need to slow down some, you need to take it a bit easy. I would say look at a few jazz standards. Um, songs like Duke Ellington are just absolutely lovely, you know. You know, that's, that's not rocket science to get tunes like that. Um, other things that I would consider with new repertoire, you know, take things from other instruments. Um, Things like um, jazz standards, which you'd normally hear on a sax, make that your own. Um, I will plug my, my, some of my own work. I did an album of songs by Scott Joplin, um, which I released earlier this year, because he's got such a strong, um, excuse me if the camera's skew with, but he's got, a, he's got a strong right hand. He's got very strong melodies and very simple um, left hands, which I could copy onto the guitar. And that made it you know, very easy to just take the melody that he was playing and read it and put it onto the chromatic harmonica. I think the instrument deserves a lot more serious pieces of music than it's been given. Um, a few serious composers have written things specifically for the chromatic harmonica, but they tend to be very academic. Um, you know, one of the greatest harmonica players on the scene at the moment is Philip Achille, and he's you know, absolutely stunning. But I listened to some of his stuff that he'd recorded with this orchestra, and it was a specifically written chromatic piece. And it was so technical and almost so jarring and so so sophisticated that I was almost like, well, I wouldn't really want to listen to this. You know, I wouldn't put this on my my iPod or whatever, just going for a jog down down the park or what have you. The, the danger is that some people I think have gone in the other direction in that a lot of songs, particularly written in like the, between like the thirties and the, the sixties are called things like sailor jig and, you know, harmonica rag at the street corner and things like that. And it's like, when I look at myself as a musician, I don't think of myself as a sailor doing a silly little jig or anything like that. So um, take some violin pieces like I did. I just did that Paganini piece. I'm working on another Paganini piece, which is, it might be a bit difficult, but give it a go. You know, try things like that, experiment with it and play your jazz standards as well. Um, New repertoire. This is my last point, and then I'll say thank you very much and take any final questions. Um, new repertoire. You can look at songs, particularly played in first and third position, which hopefully I've demonstrated um, from a C harmonica, and transfer them onto a chromatic. Um, I think Adam's going to look at Summertime. And what have you. Um, blue Drag. Songs like that, St. James Infirmary, sorry, I don't like that one. Um, other songs that you can do, just that whole third position stuff. You know, take little things like that and just cross them over onto the chromatic. And what have you. Um, the interesting thing for me is that now I've, I've taken the time, this might be a little bit advanced, but there might be some advanced players watching this either now or later when it's put on YouTube, is I sort of got to a point in my late teens and 20s where I was just, I'd done the diatonic to death, I knew how to play the blues on it and what have you. I wasn't overbending or overblowing um, at that stage. Then I went on to the chromatic and I started to take it a bit more seriously, I took music a little bit more seriously. And I, I learned things like my scales and my arpeggios. And, you know, it took a few years. In spite of me saying you can do it in three months, you know, you've got to enjoy it and plug at it. Now, with 
overblowing and overbending, I'm starting to think, what can I play on the chromatic and what can I bring back to the diatonic? And I'm really, really enjoying the sort of symbiotic relationship that the, that the two are having. And if you are a diatonic player who is a little bit more advanced, you know, having a chromatic and being able to think in both instruments is a really enjoyable thing. It is challenging and um, yeah, I am absolutely loving it. Um, there we go, that's all I've got to say. So that's, that's my little thing of warm up, play some theory, play new repertoire, play old repertoire. Thank you very much for your time. Um, I hope it's useful, I hope I haven't rambled too much and I can see more, more questions coming. Swipesy, I already know who that is. So that guy Swipesy who's been causing us trouble and has written take your trousers off is my friend Adam who is my bass player in my band and he's been trolling us the whole time. What is blow bending? At least you asked an interesting question. So that's my singer. That shows you what sort of a jokey relationship I have with my band. Do come and see us live because we're always a laugh and a lot of fun. Um, the Bad Day Blues Band. I will retype that and send that to you guys. Uh, serious questions now, if you don't mind. We've got one um, from Ross. What sort of Paganini pieces you're learning? Uh, the two most famous ones. <laughs> Um, the, the 24th, which is that one I was playing, uh, excuse me, um, and what have you, and I'm almost finished that, so I should have a recording done, hopefully by the end of next week. Um, and the other one is the fifth caprice, which is normally done on a bigger harmonica. Um, I need the music up to, to play that whole through. That will probably take me another maybe three or four weeks, maybe seven months. And bear in mind, I've been playing that piece. You've got to work on these things, even if it's just five minutes a day to get them through. Um, like I said, Franz Schmel, the best of them all, would do five hours a day to get that serious classical thing going. And at the speed that Franz used to play, if you listen to his stuff, all of his stuff is on YouTube. It's the only way you can get it. Um, his playing is just phenomenal. Um, it really is. He has such a fantastic command of the instrument. Um, what key I played sat in Dolin, um, I believe it's, um, what's the one it's written in? I think it's either G or C. It's, it'll be, um, I want to say C, because it's 251 back to C. Um, I've got the real book somewhere. It's the one that's written in the real book. Are people familiar with the real book? I'll go grab it. Ah. Ah. In fact, I was learning a song called Someday My Prince Will Come, so I should be on S. I think it was G. Any other questions while I wait? We've got Roger asking, where can I find links to the Hangouts? Does that mean these workshops? I can I, see you, Roger. Give, give, give me a thumbs up if you... Or you can unmute yourself if you like. Yeah, hi there. No, the, the paperwork, the, the on-screen... Ah, uh, yeah. Shots, it's, I wonder if there's a link to put, so I can print them all. Yeah, sorry, Roger. I Normally when I do private lessons, and I that's another plug I can give you, I do private lessons for £20 for 30 minutes. Normally I have the function to attach files and send you files directly, and I thought I would have that function today. Um, but what, we'll, what I think we'll do is when Sam posts this on the Harmonica UK website, again, well done, Sam. He's, he's working so hard for this. Um, when he posts that up there, I will make sure that he, I've already sent him the document so he can upload it then. So you'll be able to re-watch this video, pause it, slow it down, go at your own pace, break everything down, and you will have the documents. Um, and yeah, I, I do hope this lesson is useful. It's, it's nice to know if my lesson or my teaching style is working or if it's a bit boring. Were you bored at any point or was it engaging? Leave me a review on FIFA or one of those crappy websites or what have you. Uh, I've got a question for you, Sam. Yeah, go for it. Do you play the same song in different keys? Sometimes, um, particularly yeah. if it's written so. That's a good like training exercise. I rarely do it on like big pieces because it's a bit of a headache, but things like... And so on and so forth. You can just go through like that. Um, and I should do a lot more of that. I'm still at the stage... Um, because I've been so rigorous with myself saying, you must learn music, young man, you must take things seriously. I've been more to push towards classical. Um, 
and the sort of the transition I made last year is again I thought well you are interested in jazz and you want to get into jazz I've always been quite stubborn in that I've mostly either taught myself things or I've learned in group settings so I've been to group classes on the, the guitar never on the, the harmonica actually unfortunately until this stuff happened um, but I finally sort of bit the bullet last year and said actually you tend to learn most and this is what going back to what I said about YouTube, you tend to learn most by having an interaction with a person. So going to a jam, you will pick up things much more quickly because you're, in, you're bouncing off other players. Um, same if you go to a group workshop, you have to think on your feet. Whereas just watching a YouTube video, you're sort of half engaged and you're half switching off. So I did finally bite the bullet and say one-to-one -one lessons is actually probably a good thing. Um, and I did have some one-to-one -one lessons with the one and only Adam, who is the only person I've ever had one-to-one -one lessons with. If that is not an endorsement, worth its weight in gold, I don't know what is. Um, but yeah, again, those lessons just really accelerated my mind. And to answer your question directly, yes, in jazz, you do take riffs and you do play them in every key and it's, it's definitely something I need to do a lot more of. That and writing out solos, not necessarily by harmonica players, but you know, jazz players, Miles Davis or whoever you want to listen to, take their solo and write it out. That's something I need to sort of, that's almost my, my next steps for the next few months. Okay, uh, any more questions? Last chance now. I will let some um, go get a cup of tea. Tea? <laughs> oh. Doesn't look as though there's anything coming in. Um, there's a key. There's seven dollars. The key is a chance. Oh, yeah. Well, obviously, it's a jazz key, so it'll go through different keys, but it starts at C, so. I kind of want to pick up a guitar and play you the chords because, in fact, I might do that. Um, it's in C, but then you're going to do a 251 in D if you have it. So I think Adam's going to talk. Maybe he'll be talking more about this, maybe he won't. Um, but I will walk you through it very quickly. So maybe you can see what I've done, maybe you can't, but you can see I've scribbled things at the top about how the key changes as you go along. So if you've got a D minor seven to a G dominant seven, that's a two five one in C. That's quite a well. That's a two and a five against a, a C major seven. And you're going to E minor seven and A seven. That's suggesting that you're playing in D. Um, and then it briefly goes to G, A minor seven to D seven, and then F sharp briefly for one bar. But I was playing that version in C, so I was going starting on A. Pick up this one. Sorry, this harp's going to be cold. And then when you go to the bridge, you're playing an F. So you go, right? Because you've got, um, you've got a C dominant seven. The B flat is telling you that you're an F because F has one flat, as we saw. Then we're going to G. And then back to C. So Following the changes, jazz players are always talking about the changes, they mean several things, and Adam will explain this much better than me. But you're, you're, the song, as you can see, is slightly changing key as you go through. It's going around the circle. Um, no, no, it's not going around the circle, but it is going around that, that sort of wheel of changes. But you're also following the chord arpeggio is directing you what to play, which is why arpeggio is important. I did this in my most recent diatonic harmonica lesson, which is all free. Everything I do is free, and it's all... I'm not holding anything back. The arpeggio will always give you safe notes. That would be, you know, the notes I'm thinking of when I'm playing a 12 bar blues. So have I answered your question? Thank you very much, you do. No problem. There is another question here from, from Dave. Uh, what is the real book? Real book? <laughs> It's, it's an old thing, it gets printed everywhere now and they're, they're worth having a look at because there are some songs where you, you, know, you pick a Charlie Parker song and you go, oh my God, look at that. But there are other songs that are just you know, so beautiful. In the, in the sort of 1960s and 1970s, um, sort of students, I think it was in California, um, at Berkeley School, but at various other places, students were writing out jazz standards. They were writing out the head, which is the theme of the song, the head and they were writing the chords that you could go to play over it. As we just said, the arpeggios, the chord changes are fundamental to how you can solo. Um, so th those guys basically were writing out by hand what they were hearing 
and they made this thing called the Real Book, which was a collection of jazz standards, you know, songs that are so famous and so loved and are common things that you'll improvise over. And they circulated this illegally um, and they evaded all sorts of copyright laws for, for years and years. And it became known as the real book that everybody sort of had to have a secret copy of. And then in the past, I think a few decades or so, people have just said, OK, we'll, we'll put this through and we'll publish it and we can we can relax the copyright. So you can normally buy this off Amazon. You can buy it from your music shop. Um, you know, people know things like Stevie Wonder playing Alfie. Alfie's one of the first songs you read on here. Songs like All of Me, All the Things You Are. Um, Someday My Prince Will Come was what I was looking at last week. Wonderful song again by Duke Ellington called Solitude. You know, a song like that is just so easy. It's in, it's in E, I want to say it's in E flat from memory. And it's just... You know, that's not hard. But again, if you put articulation on it, All of a sudden, a very simple song becomes very, very beautiful. Um, uh, yeah, check out the real book. Okay, um, I've just got an email from Adam saying, can I resend the, um, the login details? So he's, Okay, um, no problem, no problem. He's appearing somewhere on the radar. <laughs> Actually, I know that he's last. That's fine. Last thing I'll say is I think if you check out my website, my email is on there. I'm always happy to chat to you later if you have any more questions. I am now going to get a glass of wine um, and enjoy Adam's lesson because it's going to be good. Thanks again, Sam, and thank you all. Okay, see you in a bit.